following Andrew W.K. If you are humble, nothing will touch you, neither praise nor disgrace, because you know what you are. Mother Teresa. I am at the baggage carousel of Katowice International Airport in Poland, contemplating the unshaven neck of Andrew W.K.'s hype man as he watches people slowly looping belongings. He looks like guys I've known that work in the back of kitchens, or a car mechanic cleaned up for a funeral. The night before, we were in London in a warehouse meant to serve as a green room for 20 vans with food and drinks set out on long, labeled tables. My bandmates examined with scientific precision the table set for Andrew W.K. and his crew, noting with awe everything that was different between his table and ours. Unsurprisingly, I was off in a corner trying to get drunk as fast as possible, so I can't remember anything specific they ate or stole. They were really excited, though, my boys, Unlike me, they were obsessed with the myths. He sings about getting wasted, but he's sober. He's married to a bodybuilder. He had a TV show, and the producers thought it would be zany to have him live in a sorority house for a weekend. The sisters found him to be odd, but generally all right. They were shocked when they found out that I didn't know anything about him. You'll just have to see for yourself, they said. It's really hard to explain. Andrew W.K.'s first album came out when I was 14. There he was on the cover, blood from his forehead and his nose, covering his face and running down into his mouth. There were boys I knew back then who loved that album. Only boys. And two of them I remember well. A rude, round nerd and a mama's boy who, according to popular myth, started by me, was a premature ejaculator. They were best friends, they lived in my neighborhood, and they liked picking on me enough to keep me around. They were the only indie rock boys at our small rural high school. They were obsessed with Death Cab and the Get Up Kids, trying to be a little more like Seth Cohen every day. The squat nerd with the bald spots and the shitty little sister was an ardent supporter of Andrew WK, obsessed, really, but maintained that he only liked it ironically. Some of the other boys I knew were more sincere in their love, but boys, all of them. Unfortunately, I've met more of those boys since then. They're the pretentious boys who, when they meet a girl who likes metal, only find it fair to insist that she recite the Slayer discography in reverse chronological order. If she likes comic books, she has to know every character's original origin stories, as well as subsequent changes in how they correspond to different decades and illustrators. The same boys who, a year later, when I was 15 years old, still on dial-up internet and not yet part of the world, scoffed when they found out I had never heard of a little website called Pitchfork. They were 18, and I was young and stupid. I clearly wasn't a real music fan. The ridicule and questioning were constant. Women are called upon every day to prove our right to participate in music on the basis of our authenticity or perceived lack thereof. Our credentials are constantly being checked. You say you like a band you've only heard a couple times? Well, prepare to answer which guitarist you played on a specific record and what year you left the band. But don't admit you haven't heard them either, because they'll accuse you of only saying you like that genre to look cool. Then they'll ask you if you've heard of about five more bands, just to prove that you really know nothing. This happens so often that it feels like dudes meet in secret to work on a regimented series of tests that they can use to determine whether or not we really deserve to be here. The fake geek girl test is one. Door guys stopping female musicians carrying in gear to make sure they're actually in the band and not just somebody's girlfriend is another. Big rock magazines interviewing male musicians about gear and female musicians about sexual harassment. That's up there too. 
And even if you pass their tests, you're probably just a gimmick, there to make the guys in your band look progressive, or because you're cute, or they couldn't find anybody else. Worst of all, they might compliment you and tell you that you're good for a girl. Regardless, you're never considered real. You'll never meet their idea of what a real musician or music fan looks like, because the standard is male. So, Andrew W.K. was on our flight to Poland, and the guys in my band were unbelievably excited, but we couldn't really see him because he was in first class, and we were in economy in the back with screaming children. At immigration, one of our guys was being a dick, trying to make everybody laugh, and he announced, Where's Andy? Did they rush him to the front of the line? Celebrity treatment? And I crimsoned, and my shoulders shrank up to my neck in the universal gesture of secondhand embarrassment, because I had seen him, not five places behind us, patiently waiting in the back of the line. I knew he'd heard them, and I live in fear of doing anything that could vaguely be perceived as rude, because that's high up on the list of things that young ladies don't do, the opposite of boys and wee boys. So I pretended to casually look around, and I am really awkward. So I ended up staring straight at him, expecting to meet the offended eyes of the king of partying himself. But he was staring off into space. His NYPD ball cap had made a thick dent in his hair. He had obviously been napping on the plane. His gray elastic waist sweatbands were cut off at the knees like they had been washed a hundred times. And he was wearing the sort of wraparound sunglasses that you see on old ladies at the bus stop. Those Robocop looking visor shits that go over your regular glasses. I feel weird about eating these days, or leaving the house, or existing in a material form at all, because having a body that talks too much, and sweats, and makes mistakes, is exhausting. And here's this dude, just standing around with dented hair and a napalm death shirt over sweatpants shorts, and it's almost as if the whole world isn't scrutinizing what he puts in his cart at the grocery store. What he looks like without makeup on, how his gender affects his authenticity as a performer. I was looking straight at this spaced out, sweet faced, charming guy just standing there calm and existing. It didn't make sense at first. The only people I'd known who liked his music, which at that point I had never heard and knew nothing about, were those sensitive indie boys who idolized Andrew W.K. because they believed him to be the comically outsized personification of the base, dudely desires they claimed they had somehow managed to suppress. Guys who think they deserve sexual favors because they read The Catcher in the Rye. Guys who cuff the sleeves of their cardigans in case they spill something playing Edward Forty Hands. Guys who bitch incessantly that they can't meet a girl who's actually into music. To them, Andrew and W.K. represented the parts of masculinity from which they had distanced themselves, that they could now appropriate ironically. But the second you see the guy, it's obvious that he's nothing like the image they built up of him. I was perplexed, and I vowed to investigate, which brings us forward a few hours at 4 o'clock p.m. on a 95-degree day in Katowice, Poland, as Andrew W.K. is sprinting past me in a skin-tight white shirt and jeans onto a giant festival stage illuminated with rainbow strobe lights and heavy with fake fog. His drum machine is so loud and determined and violently annoying that it makes Big Black look, a high, look like a high school AV club meeting. <laughs> And his hype man was running laps around him, all for the amusement of maybe a thousand teenagers that were going absolutely ballistic. Every single song started with an extended five-minute Rachmaninoff-esque classical piano introduction that would then sharply and jarringly increase in tempo the second he launched into the actual song, all of which were about odes to partying and getting wasted. 
he leapt into the air and headbanged to every single song, hair in his eyes while bashing out these meticulous five-finger chords with the skill and determination of Jerry Lee Lewis. He addressed the audience directly and reminded them, we are not musicians, this is our show, we are performers. I wrote that one down to use later. <laughs> it started to pour rain. He played a New Year's Eve theme song that began with him making the audience count backwards from 100 <laughs> before screaming, Happy New Year! It was August 2nd. <laughs> he ran through a really uncomfortable rap song doing synchronized choreography with his hype man and then it was over. He played for an hour straight. As they finished their performance and came running off stage, his face instantly deflated and went back to that quiet, contemplative look that I had seen in the airport. One of my bandmates was grinning ear to ear, as amazed as I was at what he had seen, and he stuck out his hand for a high five, and Andrew, who had probably recognized him as being the asshole in the airport, blew him off completely. I was possessed. I was in love. It was the most intense performance I had ever seen. And that night I pulled up in my hotel room and read everything I could find. Here I thought this guy was the patron saint of butt metal and keg parties, whose genuine positivity and desire to shut off brains in the name of fun had been co-opted by pretentious music snobs who were basically making fun of him. And here I find that he's a classical, university-trained pianist who had begun studying at the age of five. He spent his adolescence playing noise and experimental music and later played the current 93 in Borders. He was a motivational speaker at a brony convention, lecturing about positivity and the good, healthy community surrounding a creepy, reprehensible, and disgusting fandom known for appropriating and sexualizing a cartoon made for little girls. He'd had multiple TV shows, written advice columns in international newspapers. There's nothing this guy hadn't done, and he wasn't a moron. He was really talented, and probably a genius. But the facts still weren't lining up. I couldn't find a logical bridge between the happy guy that I was reading about, the guy that I had seen on stage, the guy who had accomplished all of these incredible and strange things, and the mellow, almost morose guy that I had seen in the airport. Some people went totally nuts when they found out that Lana Del Rey was at least partially an industry construct. After surviving teenage alcohol dependency and moving to a trailer park in Jersey to record a first album that by all accounts bombed, she reinvented herself by a process that seemed to combine the two overarching themes in her life, her obvious deep sadness and her part in the collective experience of being sexualized as a young woman. And when it worked, good for her, she put in many years of very hard work. She immediately became the victim of targeted attacks and constant negative commentary about her authenticity as a performer. This woman, who really does play shows and write songs and suffer scrutiny, is written off as a fake. But never mind her anxiety-ridden early television performances. People came at her for possibly having had lip injections. It was Jezebel and the dogs. She started singing exclusively in her lower register because she felt it would make people take her more seriously she dyed her hair darker, and she used a sexier stage name, and suddenly there were people trying to ruin her career. Tabby Gevinson put it brilliantly when she said that Lana Del Rey has many different qualities that women in our culture aren't allowed to be all at once, so people are trying to find the inauthentic one. Early on, when Lana Del Rey was asked if she was enjoying her new success despite all the backlash, she said, I never felt any of the enjoyment. It was all bad, all of it. Which is why I was shocked when I found out that years ago, Andrew W.K. held a public press conference 
after some bizarre legal trouble later attributed to a black male driven spat with a former friend and producer, where he announced that it was time to admit the persona was a fake character invented by him, his lawyer, Professor Father, and record label. The entire thing was a cleverly planned piece of living theater that was meant to seem very real, but the ruse had gotten too large and complicated to maintain. He wasn't even the first person cast in the role of Andrew W.K. But unlike Lana Del Rey, he's granted not only leeway, but an entirely new cultural importance. I have read a dozen websites dedicated to exposing Andrew W.K. as an innocent pawn of the Masons, or the Illuminati, <laughs> of a decade-long government mind control plot. There are semi-scholarly articles debating whether the man, the persona, or the music is the real art of Andrew W.K. Concept piece. Fans gather on forums to compare pictures from shows in different countries, trying to determine if it's the same Andrew on stage every night. And it's twisted that people only seem to love the idea of him more after the truth came out. Because the truth is so much more interesting. He's fearless, talented. He has a dark, theoretical, and critical mind. He's on television with Glenn Beck talking about how he's afraid of abortion. But it was his transformation into a party dude at the hands of the music industry that made people pay attention to him. Meanwhile, He's up there with Ian Spinonius at the Guggenheim talking about how his early experience is exploring the interstice between pure music and unwanted sound have shaped his intentionality in the Andrew W.K. presentation. The kids in Katowice were there to have fun and get wasted. <laughs> it's Harmony Corinne playing dumb for Letterman back in the 90s over and over and over in a way, everybody loses. It's like nobody was listening when he himself told them at point blank range that he isn't real. But when a female musician is in any way fake, she's denied creative agency and written off as uninvented and talentless. Beyonce is accused of lip syncing, even when she's not. Music rags run articles exposing pop stars' real names, highlighting Lord, Lady Gaga, Nicki Minaj, Miley Cyrus. But being that these are the most successful female artists in the world, one has to assume that their fakeness, or as we should be calling it, reinvention, is necessary for women to succeed in the music industry. It's the basic principle of survival based off Darwin's evolution, adapt and evolve or die. And of the women I listed, look at what they've done that gets them called fake. Taking on more seductive names, personas, getting breasts and ass lifts and lip implants, wearing makeup, wearing more elaborate, sexy, sometimes borderline fetish costumes, everything that men claim they want out of women. But that's not good enough. Those qualities have to be both present and completely natural in order for spectators to be satisfied. Those spectators being, in many cases, the party-hard, ham-headed, debt-wasted dorks who are willing to stand out in the rain to count backwards from 100 with a man whose entire career is built out of tricking those morons into thinking he's one of them. What then? What then for Andrew? Not Andrew W.K., but Andrew, the person who confuses the hell out of me who I'll probably never be lucky enough to see again, who, if he ever finds out about this, will probably file for a restraining order, <laughs> who seemingly receives nothing but support for being a complete fake. 
as talented a musician as I've ever seen, but who must be affected by the pressures of maintaining this persona as any other performer. If he permanently gave up code switching and explored the space between the keg party and the Guggenheim, if he decided to perform as himself. This is one of those rare occasions where I will whip out a line that I usually loathe, that feminism is for men too. But look at this double standard of gender and authenticity through the lens of our culture, and it all makes sense. And what's more, it's sad. Andrew W.K., the persona, might be the ultimate wicker man for dudes of my generation who were raised as all men are to repress their feelings. Not wanting to become their fathers who worked their way through the 70s and 80s when men were still adjusting to workplace equality and the elimination of the 1950s patriarch role, an identity crisis that often resolved itself through heavy drinking they internalized that aimless masculine aggression and sadness. But in the navel gaze of the 90s and emo 2000s, backed by capitalism and the assembly line homogeneity of music, culture, even food, they had no option but to make that crazed, bottomless feeling ironic. Make it about loud, repetitive, boring music partying hard, and insisting that you're having fun. All a convenient excuse for the ultimate cure for comforting your bleak feelings, getting wasted. And Christ, they would rather attribute it to an Illuminati kidnapping plot than take responsibility for their actions. bizarre truth inherent here that real women with fake names are somehow considered exponentially less authentic than completely fake men harboring a real hidden sadness, I've come to one conclusion, that the cult of personality surrounding artists exists because of an unfeeling world that loves nothing more than breaking down sensitive and talented people. The oppressive systems that surround us have forced us to assume personas like castles had moats. They can't protect you forever, but they might work temporarily for a little while to keep the bad guys from coming in. That's not safe or good for human hearts, regardless of their respective privileges in regards to class or gender. I'm reminded of another artist who suffered the pressures of maintaining a public persona that wasn't at all indicative of his inner struggle, the late Robin Williams, who used to tell a sad joke about this, where a man goes to the doctor and begs, please help me, doctor, everything is meaningless and I have nothing to live for, what should I do? And the doctor says, the cure is simple. Go and see the great clown Pagliacci. He's in town for one night only, and he can make anyone smile. His face falls and he cries out, Doctor, I am Pagliacci. <laughs> <laughs>